Hello and welcome to the uh, second session on the second day of the conference. Um, for those who weren't with us yesterday, I'm Sean. Um, I'm the co-host for this event. Um, and I'll be moderating the careers panel discussion today. Um, we've got some great speakers lined up for you today on this panel discussion. But um, before we get introducing them, I'd just like to run through how this session is going to work. Um, so first, I'll introduce the speakers briefly and then ask for each of them to provide a short five minute presentation on their background and careers to date. Um, and then the rest of the session will be led by um, questions from you, the audience, um, and just discussion. And we'll see where it goes. Um, the aim of this session is to give you the opportunity to really like, delve deeper into the careers of some of the leading names from the academic, clinical and industrial sectors of the P&O field and to highlight the diversity of the opportunities available. It's also a unique opportunity to gain an insight into their experiences and advice on how to mould and shape your career. So I'd really encourage you to get involved as much as possible with this and um, feed any questions that you'd like to, um, me to ask the panellists through our live chat function on the website. And I'll try and get through as many of these as possible um, in the time we have. Um, so I'd just like to start by um, introducing all the speakers and inviting them to share. So first we have um, Peter Lee, from, who is a professor of biomedical engineering at the University of Melbourne. You all right, Peter? Uh, like to unmute yourself. Hello, you all right? Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, nice to be here. Very excited about this career panel discussion. Look forward to your questions. Yeah. Um, do you do you, right? Do you want me to do the five minutes now? Or? I'll introduce everyone first and get them into the okay. top. All right. Um, okay. Next, thank you. next, we have uh, Kathy Holloway, who's a professor at UCL um, Interaction Centre and co-founder and academic director of the Global Disability Innovation Hub. Um, hello, you're at Kathy. I'm all right, thanks. How are you guys? Uh, yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Good, good. Nice um, to see you, Peter. Hi, good to see you, Kathy. Uh, next, we have uh, Paul Fotheringham, who is founder of uh, 3D Life Prints. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Unfortunately, I won't put my video on today. I'm not in an appropriate place, but uh, really looking forward to this chat today and uh, to hear some great questions. Um, and last but not least, we have Elaine Owens, who's a clinical specialist physiotherapist who's been awarded an MBE for her work. And for those who were with us yesterday, it's the same Elaine that was um, name dropped quite a lot in the development of care session around the Oscar um, for rehabilitation um, work. You all right, Elaine? Um, so, Peter, would you like to share your presentation first in just a short five minutes? Yep, yep, I'll do that now. Um, let me try this. Right, you um, can see my slides okay? Uh, is that okay? Yeah, good. Right, um, just a very quick, quick introduction. Um, I'm a professor uh, at the Medical Engineering Department. Um, I'm also a director of the Australian Research Council Training Center on Medical Implant Technologies. So this is very similar to, to a, a CDT in the UK. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about it later. Now, this, this is a picture that was taken in 2019, uh, Christmas party. So we haven't had a Christmas party since 2019. Uh, I guess all of you know why. So suddenly uh, we, we, we have earned um, a reputation in Melbourne for being the longest uh, lockdown city. And it's all open up now and we are certainly looking forward to a new uh, a Christmas party end of this year. Now, what I'm gonna do is just uh, very quickly run through with you, you know, what's been happening in my career so uh, I have a, a, a deep connection with the UK. So you can see that I graduated uh, many years ago uh, as a Bachelor of Engineering, Mechanical Engineering at University of Strathclyde. And then I joined the Wolfson Center and did uh, my PhD there uh, in bioengineering. Uh, following that, I continued as a postdoc and I went back to Singapore. So I'm originally from Singapore. And, and I joined a research institute that focuses on materials, right? I was there for a couple of years. Um, I must say during that two years, I got a little bit bored with research. And then I started to delve into uh, business development. 
So I stayed with the Institute, uh, went and did business development and, and get bored again <laughs> and, and then joined um, a, a defense uh, laboratory uh, in Singapore, one of the largest defense laboratory and started working with uh, human prote uh, soldier protection, primarily uh, 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 being a lab head, uh, a research program manager. And then I joined the university in 2008. So you can see my, I, I, I only started a full academic career in 2008 uh, at the University of Melbourne. So what is my research about very quickly? Um, it's about mechanical forces on biological materials. So these are cells, tissue, organs, and body. They generate stresses and strain. And then because of all these stresses and strain, you cause you know, things to break. So we, whether we're walking, breathing, or just keeping ourselves alive, you know, we apply mechanical forces. So I have been uh, really focusing my whole entire career, I must say, on this one particular area, mechanical forces. And sort of that took me quite far, I must say. It actually surprises myself. Right. Um, so uh, I started working on projects with the defense. Um, um, my PhD was about prosthetics, uh, you know, stump socket interface pressures, uh, one of the very early studies during those years. And then uh, we even started working with pharmacological, uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so using mechanical forces to uh, test the efficacy of drugs. Um, we do a lot of work on orthopedic maxillofacial implants, so 3D printing. Um, uh, we, we have developed uh, uh, new methods uh, like this particular TMJ implant, the temporal mandibular joint uh, implant uh, that was customized. And we even work with uh, the racing industry in preventing uh, uh, equine bone fracture. So all this, you can see the, the, the fundamental knowledge around all this that I've just discussed with you is around mechanical forces. Now, then sometimes I do think, you know, what, what, is, what is the main goal of my research besides all those that I've just explained to you? And, you know, I'm quite excited about, you know, what my students have been achieving. So I'm starting to find, you know, somewhat a new uh, motivation for my career is really training uh, students like yourself for impact. So these are some of my recent graduate. Um, you can see um, uh, some of them decided not to follow my footstep. <laughs> so for example, uh, Gabriel, a uh, research engineer now with Airbus in France. Uh, Sheridan, uh, she did um, uh, the prosthetic uh, project uh, working with with ICRC and, and, and the folks in Vietnam when we were doing some low cost prosthetic devices. She's now a defense scientist. Um, and Ranim, uh, she's uh, in Canada, uh, a research fellow looking at uh, fall prevention in older adults. Now, um, so very quickly, the ARC training center, um, it looks somewhat like this, uh, many, many partners. And most of this you can see are industry and hospital partners. You may recognize some of their names. Um, now, so what we did was we got around 22 partners together uh, and formed a consortium. And we got the funding from the, AR, the Australian Research Council to train uh, PhD students and postdocs uh, to work with industries. Um, this is my last slide. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting slide. It was the opening of the center. And uh, on your left, you'll see Sarah. She's a PhD student. Uh, Richard, uh, orthopedic surgeon. Um, uh, Tracy, she's uh, from the TGA, uh, like the FDA in the US. Eric is a small media enterprise company in 3D printing. And Maddie, she's from Materialize, a multinational company. Now, we got all of them sitting there talking you know, about uh, personalized medical devices and what you know, PhD students do, their roles. But I wanted to show you this picture because um, you know, Sarah being a PhD student are guided by all these individuals. And of course, Sarah could choose any of those careers uh, that she can see right in front of her. So I think um, the world is your oyster. Right, uh, there are many opportunities, uh, so your PhD will open many doors.
All right, I'll finish it. Thanks for that, Peter. That was um, that was really good. Thank you. Thanks for that overview. Um, Kathy, would you like to go next? Okay. Yeah, sure. Hi. Um, I don't have slides, so I was quickly trying to put a few together, but I, I think it's easier if I just talk about uh, my career. Um, so I grew up in nursing homes, and my parents had nursing homes in England, and I spent my summer holidays in Ireland, which is where my parents are from. And I grew up between England and Ireland uh, at a time when there was a lot of conflict between England and Ireland. And it was quite an interesting uh, space to grow up in and eventually moved to Ireland, uh, back to Ireland and, and went to university in Ireland. So I did um, my undergraduate degree at the National University of Ireland, Galway, um, where I studied industrial engineering, the design stream of industrial engineering. I think I tried to drop out of my degree every single year because I thought it was an utter waste of time and like what you know what was the point of it all and my girlfriend at the time convinced me every year that I should you know my grades were good like what was I going to do otherwise I didn't seem to have a plan b so I should probably just keep going um, but I was increasingly frustrated with the fact that industrial engineering just meant we were going to make everybody more productive um, and like create more sort of uh, uh, sort of quality uh, control you know like how do you make um, things more efficiently around the world and I, I, I suppose somewhere deep inside me, I, I really didn't care about that, um, but I didn't know what else to do. Um, so I don't come from a, a family of academics. I'd, I'd never met anybody who's an academic before I became an academic. Um, I, you know, when I was in school, I, I was told, I, I said I wanted to be a doctor and, and my career advisor told me I'd make a good nurse because it was a small village in Ireland and, and girls at the time didn't become doctors. We, we became nurses. So I didn't have like some big ambition to, um, to be an academic. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I didn't really, have, I just want to get a job. So I, I left uh, my degree and I applied for a job in Medtronic um, in Galway and I uh, became a research and development engineer in Medtronic. Um, my plan at the time was to work for about three or four years. Um, I'd bought a house, uh, it was during the boom in Ireland, and then I would just travel the world and I'd figure out what I wanted to do then. That was my plan. It seemed a good job. I was designing angioplasty catheters. Um, Medtronic were a lovely company to work for. The, the group was nice, a lot of material science, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of testing, got to learn a lot about how to do animal trials, how to do human trials, uh, uh, all of the regulation stuff. It was all really interesting for a couple of years. And I also got drawn into innovation. So this was when my love of innovation began. So there was a threat in Ireland at the time that we were really cheap uh, lab labour at the time. Um, and it, there was a a feeling that within a few years, South America or India or somewhere else would become cheap labor and the manufacturing jobs would move there. And so there was a drive uh, from above to try and make our own patents, our own innovations and demonstrate to the Americans that we had a, a value in and of ourselves uh, you know, as a, as a research and development unit. And so myself and my boss at the time was sort of charged with trying to do this. And I don't know if you've ever met a kind of, I can only describe them as stereotypical engineers um, who uh, all were male or were white or were Irish, who did not really want to do things like co-design and play with straws and be <laughs> inventive. And, but we tried to get them to, to increase uh, their, the, the innovations. And also the, the culture in Ireland wasn't to own things, really. It was, we're not like, yeah just culturally it'd be like oh yeah no I did that that's grand I don't need my name on it it's fine it was a team effort you know so trying to get people to claim patents was actually really hard so it was a lot of culture change um so I did that for a couple of years and eventually for, for personal reasons I uh, my partner then wanted to move to uh, to London um she was a poet uh, she wanted to move here um and I didn't really see yeah I was a bit bored at that stage in Medtronic and so I thought if I'm going to move to London what do I really want to do like this now might be my chance to decide what I really want to do with my life. Um, and so I thought back to my, you know, days growing up in nursing homes and, and fixing technologies for, for older people and realised I didn't really want to make angioplasty catheters anymore because for me they were like a technology where, which we could be fixed by basically not eating so much saturated fat and, and exercising a bit more. And it was just mainly for rich, com rich people in rich countries to get richer. So I thought, actually I care more about this technology so I ended up at UCL uh, doing a PhD in biomechanics of wheelchair propulsion which is going back to my days in the nursing home I used to play in wheelchairs all the time push people in wheelchairs always been quite obsessed with wheelchairs so um, I continue to be obsessed with wheelchairs 
And so I, my PhD was in biomechanics of wheelchair propulsion, and, and it was split between the civil engineering department uh, and the um, Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital um, up in Stanmore. And I basically split my time as a PhD student between clinical places, you know, working with physios and OTs and surgeons and, and the gate lab and, and doing detailed biomechanical models of shoulders and, and backs and, and trying to uh, speak with and, and, and work with wheelchair users to talk about what they really want. Uh, another bit of time working with transport engineers to, to understand how we build the built environment and how do we make the built environment more accessible. And about another third of my time, I started doing a lot of philosophy. Um, I, I started getting very interested in science technology studies and what is the role of technology generally in, in society. Um, I finally finished my PhD, uh, I spun out a company from the PhD, which was a, a sensor measurement system, which would measure the biomechanics of, of wheelchair propulsion. It's called Power Sense Wheel. We called it Power Wheel, then we called it Sense Wheel. I can't remember what they called it in the end. Um, it seems decades ago. It still runs. The company still legitimately still exists. We keep meaning to close it. It's called Movement Metrics. That was my first spin out. Um, I learned a lot about spin outs, learned a lot about innovation. Um, then ran the Pamela Lab at, 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 Metro, at UCL. That, that turns over, you know, about 30 or 40 million a year. Um, so we designed the next generation of tube trains. I did uh, genetic experiments, people with different eyesight conditions, like. Uh, People, then assistive technology design um, crutches with springs in sensors with with Lawrence and Co at, at, at Salford. Um, so we did a whole maybe three or four years of running the Pamela Lab and 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 working and, and making other people's experiments come to life. So people would arrive with a problem, and I would make figure out how to make that those experiments happen. Um, and along the way, I, I decided that I probably wanted to be an academic um, and, and got my lectureship at UCL um, in accessibility engineering, which is in transport. Um, yeah, it's fine. And um, and then, yeah, stayed there for a couple of years teaching transport engineers and, and teaching on two master's courses, rehab and, and also transport, uh, trying to get the people building bridges between those two worlds. Um, until finally we got the opportunity to start the Global Disability Innovation Hub and during that time I transferred my academic position from civil engineering um, to computer science where I am currently a professor of interaction design and innovation and a, and a co-founder of the Global Disability Innovation Hub um, and, and since starting GDI Hub I, I think more than anything I, I've learned two things which I would just give as pieces of advice in life. One is work in a culture and with people that you love because then it doesn't matter what everyone else thinks you just go to work each day and, and love I, I genuinely love the interactions I have with our master's students with our PhD students with the, the academic team I have um, and within UCL generally it, you know you couldn't pay me 10 million a year and I wouldn't move um, and, and and secondly just really follow your dream I wanted to do something like GDI hub probably from my first year of undergraduate I just didn't quite know it um, I didn't know how to get there either. So uh, my other bit of advice is not, not to worry that you don't know where you're going. <laughs> my, my career is very varied, um, but I've got to exactly where I think I've probably always wanted to be. So, um, so yeah, I, I do believe if you keep going, you, you sort of end up there in the end. Cheers, thank you very much, Cathy. <clears throat> uh, Paul, would you like to share your slides now? Sure, no problem. Um... Hi, can you see that okay? Oh, super. Great. Well, good morning, everyone, again. Uh, my name is Paul Fotheringham, and um, I'll take a little run through my sort of career highlights to date. Um, as you'll sort of see, it's a very computer science focused and technology focused, and, and I'll get to the point why I'm here today. And, uh, and now I run a, a medical 3D printing technology business um, based out of the UK. So originally, I was a computer scientist um, from Edinburgh University, uh, and then a bit of a nomadic lifestyle really over the next sort of 15 years, um, starting in New York, where I worked in Trump Towers um, as a computer administrator and really took quite a traditional route in the IT world um, from there. So the second from there was moving to Seoul, where I started to run infrastructure for English language schools, of all things. Um, from there, I moved to London, um, where I started moving to a bit um, less of the engineering world and more into the architecture world from an IT perspective um, for British Petroleum, uh, and then moved into the world of uh, stock exchanges, where I started to architect stock exchanges um, for London, uh, for the Italians, for the Germans, and so forth. Um, from there, I moved to Hong Kong, 
um, where I then acted as a high frequency trading systems architect. Um, so working with the sort of algos and working with the, the things that caused the flash crashes um, back in the recession in uh, 2007, et cetera, wasn't my fault. Um, but at that point, I was getting a bit disillusioned, I think, with the corporate life, you know, working for large investment banks, working for the, well, the banking world in its entirety. Um, I was given the opportunity to move to Kenya um, to act as the CTO for a global microfinance company uh, called Opportunity International. Um, it works in about 23 countries and provides access to finance for those, uh, those less fortunate. Um, it really uh, operates as a retail bank, but with quite heavy IT infrastructure connecting the, the world together. Um, but really, at this point, this gave me the sort of the, the, the move towards what I'm doing just now. But I saw a need for prosthetics in the developing world, especially in East Africa. There's a lot of people, unfortunately, with, without access to prosthetics. Um, it comes under the four A's that we sort of looked at was accessibility, affordability, awareness and acceptance. So at that point, 3D printing was in its infancy quite a bit in terms of the technology available, the materials available. Um, so we started looking at transradial um, devices, you know, simple uh, non-electronic devices that uh, we can provide to, to patients across, across the region. So really that was back in 2012 where we started the organization as a social enterprise. Unfortunately, we soon found out that trying to create a sustainable organization like that is very difficult in terms of funding. Um, we didn't want to be co constantly chasing the grants um, to, to keep things going. So we're given the opportunity um, in the UK to set up the first of a kind um, for what we call an embedded point of care facility, where we have people and tech uh, in the hospitals um, that provides medical devices of all types um, to the surgeons, to the clinicians. Um, and then in the next few slides, I'll go a bit more in depth around where the business has sort of gone now and the sort of areas we play in, including prosthetics, including, um, as Peter mentioned as well, around uh, TMJs and around cranial maxillofacial implants. I personally live in Barcelona, where I've been here for five years, um, where I run uh, the UK and uh, now the US operations, and uh, we've started up in, in Houston. Um, you know, our bread and butter is, is biomedical engineers um, within our organization, and we're growing quite fast. There you go. So there's a few pictures um, around where we started as an organization, really. Um, so from the left here, you can see you know, this is our, our initial quite bad attempts at making uh, prosthetics using 3D printing um, for, for below wrist uh, or deformities or, or amputees. You know, most of the people within the East African region, you know, it is the upper body region that we suffer from industrial accidents, um, suffer from, you know, from things like snake bites and, and others sort of trauma cases, car crashes, etc. So really, you know, we started to try, you know, for free, trying to, trying to assist those and, and perfect our techniques um, with design. So we brought on board a bunch of prosthetists and orthotists and worked with some of the leading universities in California um, to sort of come up with simple yet effective designs. So the picture to the right is a gentleman um, who lost his hand in a fishing accident in Cambodia. So really this was sort of taken to the next version two, version three of what we called the life arm uh, with customized sockets um, and the ability for, for them to, to you know, use a um, uh, shoulder actuated harness to, to power a simple device, you know, that allowed them to pick up a spade, allowed them to, to work the land and so forth. Um, and as you can see from the third picture, you know, this is how we were printing it um, in, in its entirety uh, in one to try and cut down on the time for printing and the, and the chance for, for errors really. Um, we also uh, started to look at prosthetic covers. So as you can see from the lady in the picture there, um, for below knee prosthetic covers that were customized to the color um, as much as possible, customized towards the contour of, of the body um, because, you know, the options available back in the day were certainly were white or black. Um, and so there's no in between colors. Uh, and so we want to try and address that social issue that was happening where the acceptance rate for these covers were very low um, because of the, the, the mismatch. On the right hand side is a slightly sort of different humanitarian angle that we, we still work on quite heavily. Um, we make 3D printed replica landmines and uh, other devices, explosive remnants of war. Uh, the top picture you can see this is the white helmets. Um, so they are using them to train in Syria uh, as to what not to touch, basically. Um, and in the bottom right, uh, we've been a few times now to the UN General Assembly, um, where we presented what, what we've been doing to, towards the world, basically, uh, including the prosthetics. Uh, and these have been adopted by ICRC and other places around the world, um, both for the, 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 you know, to stop you being blown up and then to help you if you have lost limbs, etc. cetera, um, you know, in most of the conflict and post-conflict nations. So where is the life prints today? 
Um, so as I mentioned, we have point of care medical three hubs. Um, so we have five or six in the UK now um, where we have engineers and, and technology within there. Um, we work across all disciplines, so cardio, cardiovascular, cardiothoracic, uh, craniomaxillofacial, uh, orthopedics, general, uh, neurology, et cetera, to create medical devices. Now, these medical devices are, are serious devices. Um, they're used for patient treatment. They're used in the surgery. They're used in your body. Um, so we are ISO 13485 certified, uh, and it's, it's been quite a journey for us to get that certification uh, and soon to be your FDA as well. So it's a journey that I think a lot of uh, organizations in the med tech world you will know, have to tackle because the rules are tightening very quickly to, to avoid any undue patient uh, problems, really. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we have lots of biomedical engineers, uh, product engineers that work with us um, in the US and in the UK. And as I mentioned a brief second ago around, you know, what do we actually make? So we make uh, patient specific. So everything for us is personalized. It all comes from, from the, the, the scans, the CT scans, the MRI scans. So both virtual and physical. Um, we make a lot of surgical guides that are used for bone sarcoma, uh, for oncology, um, and then into the orthopedic um, and CMF implant for man mandibles, for orbitals and so forth. All three printed in-house uh, by ourselves in, in a variety of polymers and metals. We still do quite a bit of work with prosthetic and orthotics um, with, uh, for example, University of Oxford. Um, a lot of progressions there within, um, within uh, Transradio again. And uh, I sit on the board with uh, for the CDT program. So really pleased to, to be uh, talking today. Uh, and lastly, you can see in the bottom right-hand corner an example of uh, some of the surgical simulation work we do, where we create uh, very realistic uh, kidneys, hearts, livers uh, that can be cut, that can be sutures, they can beat, they can have blood through them. Uh, and that's been quite an exciting sort of series of, of years for us to develop these very high fidelity models that enable clinicians to be able to practice better um, before, before the, the real deal. So really, you know, when I started this organization back in Kenya, I never thought it would morph into what it is today, um, you know, from a social enterprise into a fully fledged business. Um, so really, you know, we've learned a lot, we've made a lot of mistakes, uh, and hopefully we can give some insight into towards, you know, where are the career paths, you know, should you want to, to work in this type of sector, which is a kind of crossover between medical devices, services, technology, prosthesis, and, and so forth. So really, I see it as sort of five or six different ways you can do this. And this is just my experience. And this is my first company I've started. So uh, I'm certainly not, the, not the, the facto expert on this. But really, you know, you can start with the, the corporates like uh, the, the technology world, um, but with you know, people like Otterbock or, or, or Blatchford. Um, a lot of people who work for us now have started in the NHS um, and sort of, you know, as clinical scientists, uh, and then moved into, into med tech uh, SMEs. Um, we also have a lot of people who work with uh, NGOs, so Red Cross, uh, Handicap International, um, and other places that, that work um, around the globe doing great work. Um, things like medical device manufacturer. Uh, I know it's Kathy said she, she worked for, um, for Medtronic. Um, we have some Medtronic people in our organization or ex-Medtronic people. Um, so really that's another, another route as well. Um, and also you, know, you can join an SME technology. Uh, and lastly, you can start your own company, but uh, I would say it's not for the faint hearted. Um, it's uh, been a very hard journey to try and keep a company sustainable over the years um, in a market that's difficult. Uh, bureaucratic, uh, and it's very hard actually to get reimbursed for the products and services that we, that we do, especially within the NHS. So really, that's a, a quick whiz through my, my uh, career and uh, looking forward to answering questions. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Cheers for that. Um, and finally, Elaine, would you just like to share your, um, share your career for five minutes? Can you see that and hear me? Okay, thanks, Sean, nice to see you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me um, to this panel um, discussion. Oh, for some reason, when you do things, and I'm teaching, so I'm moving slides on, you have to go back. Anyway, there we go. So basically, I'll just give you a five minute tour of 50 year career as a physiotherapist. Um, when I left school, I went to work in a Cheshire home, which if people don't know about Cheshire homes, um, they're, they're residential places for people with disability, adults with disability, um, where they can be residential. And so I was um, doing a lot of the caring, helping people get up in the morning, go to bed, eating and going to the toilet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
And then I decided to become a physiotherapist. Um, so in 1971, I started training as a physiotherapist. And 50 years later, as Sean said, I'm very proud of some of the awards I've got. And the question is, how did I get there when really I'm just a jobbing physio? That's what I do. I'm a jobbing physio. I'm a full-time physiotherapist. In 1971, when we were training as a physiotherapist, we ran the hospital. So we didn't go to university. We went and worked in the hospitals or in outpatients in the morning. And then we went to lectures in the afternoon. Then we did our academic writing in the evening and weekends. So we basically... Um, ran the hospitals really that's how they ran um, so you can imagine the amount of experience one got over three years of doing that of working with um, uh, lots of people uh, very senior consultants senior physiotherapists who've been working for many years so it was a hell of a, um, a, a training really and the number of patients you had met by the time you finished your training um, patients you'd spoken to, uh, the amount of clinicians you'd spoken to was absolutely um, enormous. Um, so come 2012, I was awarded an MBE um, in the New Year's Honour List from the Queen for services to children with disability. Um, and that's one of my proudest things, um, because uh, that nomination involved um, parents and uh, clinicians and colleagues from all over the world um, making that nomination. But then how did it get to that, basically? So in the 1970s, when I was working in the hospitals um, um, as a student, and then afterwards, you had to do in those days, you had to do three or four years in the National Health Service um, after you were trained, before you could leave. Um, of course, I did a massive amount of clinical work. I did a huge amount of interdisciplinary team working. It was all very interdisciplinary in those days. It's a term that people now use. If it's something perhaps quite new, it was really interdisciplinary in those days. The health service had very little money. It was really in its infancy, in fact. And everybody had to be very efficient with a small amount of resources. And that involved a lot of interdisciplinary teamwork. And I learned a huge amount from others, from the experienced people around me, from the patients and reading, of course. So um, they're the three um, elements, aren't they, of evidence-based medicine is to just get experience, um, to, to get the evidence from the reading, um, and also to hear about what the patient's preferences are, what, what is it they want um, in their rehabilitation and their lives. So I had a very good grounding, essentially. Um, but then I met my husband and moved to North Wales, which was unexpected, because prior to that, I'd been working with strokes and wanting to go really into adult neurology. So moved to North Wales, and this was the patch we were covering. It's 1,500 square miles. And in a little village here called Llanbarwechen, there was a great big institution um, for uh, people with learning disability and mental health problems. And also we had a child development centre in Bangor. So I was working um, in um, this institution with, there were two, I mean, people really won't understand it, I think, in this day and age. Um, but there were two wards of children and a school in that institution. Um, I was given a key to go around and visit all the what they called villas because they were all lock up um, and meet everybody. They'd never had a physio there before. And many of the residents in that institution had been there all their lives. And there were still two wards of children and a school in that institution. So when I went round with my key and unlocked and went round to every villa and said, hello, I'm Elaine, the new physio. Everyone said, great, we've never had a physio, but I have never seen levels of disability. I'd been working as a physio for a, a good number of years, but I had never seen the levels of disability, physical disability, um, untreated physical disability um, in those villas. And of course, the children there who were having absolutely nothing, as were most children in those days, even on the community. So I was working with young children and with the adults. Um, so again, and we had this huge patch to cover. So again, we had to be terribly efficient with very small amount of resources. But also I was working with a really big team 
So it was very interdisciplinary with nurses, psychologists, pediatricians, everybody on the leading edge of working um, together to try and help these patients who'd had nothing and are li were likely to have nothing and very little for the rest of their lives. So what I learned from that was more interdisciplinary teamwork. Um, and when I say interdisciplinary, it was almost transdisciplinary, like we all took on each other's roles, okay? Um, Again, more clinical work, again, really learning from others, from the experienced folk that I work with from the patients, again, read, 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 and being very efficient with small resources. And as well as that, what I really learned was how important it was to understand natural history and prognosis. Where do these conditions go if they're not treated, which you could see um, in the institution? As well as that, because I was working with psychologists um, and with behavioral nurses who were doing behavioral work with learning disability, I learned an awful lot about learning theories. How do you train people to do motor tasks? How do you get motor learning? How do you do that? Um, because they were training people to feed and I was using those behavioral techniques and positive reinforcement, um, et cetera, et cetera, in physiotherapy. So taking those skills of how do you train skills into physiotherapy? Of course, I was working on the community. And so I was working with families and children. So in schools, in homes, um, we had clinics as well. So we had little play groups. I was working with the whole range of patients from tiny babies in special care through to adults um, with um, disability. And of course, I learned a huge amount because we were working with those families in their homes and with those children in their homes and their schools. So learned a huge amount about being family centered, learning what they wanted for their lives and doing the best for the children. So became a whole system was family centered. People talk about family, family centered care now. Our child development team was family centered. That's what it was. OK. And as well as that, of course, there are lots of approaches to physiotherapy. At the time, bow bath was big. Conductive education was getting big. There are all these different forms of physiotherapy. People tended to train and put themselves in one camp. I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to train in all of them and take the good things from each of them and ignore the things that aren't useful in each of them. So I did Bobath training in London, conductive education training in Hungary. I have to say most of this was funded by myself, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then as well as that, um, my husband and I actually fostered a child with disability um, when he was six here, so he, uh, he'd had a head injury. Um, and we continued to, it was respite fostering, so he's with us every sort of uh, week or so, um, respite and in holidays and whatever. Um, and at age 14, I went to live with him for a bit because of circumstances. And, and uh, we're still in contact with him. He's in his 40s, absolutely wonderful. And of course, from that, I learned massive amount about how it is to live and actually bring up a child um, with disability. Um, and I modified a lot of what I did with families and children after that, about how much I gave them to do in the day. You have no idea how hard it is during the day and how hard it is actually getting going to bed at the end of the day when everything's um, um, had to be full of pace through the day. So, um, one of the advices I give everyone is um, whichever conditions you're working with, try and find some way of living in their lives, go to live with them, go work with them, go out with them, do social things, whatever, because that is a huge way of um, learning um, about what's important. But then I went and did some more training. So I went to Strathclyde. Um, and I got an MSc. So that, of course, was my first degree because as a physio, I wasn't at university for my first degree. My MSc was the first degree I got. Um, and I know you don't get a hat, but Peter and David lent me a hat for this lovely picture. So, of course, I was learning a huge amount. These are engineers. Yeah. David and, and Brenda, David Simpson, Brenda McHugh, massive influence on me, absolutely huge influence on me in helping me understand the biomechanics and engineering. And of course, I'd also learned a lot from Barry Meadows was up there and also from Arthur Taylor, who was a Salford engineer who I'd been working with doing seating, um, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, the rest is history. Because of the training and the extra training, I had the postgraduate diplomas I had in lower limb orthotic biomechanics and clinical gait analysis and doing ESMAC training. 
we were able to get one of the first video vector gate labs. This is John Stallard, who developed it together with um, Richard Major um, at Orlau. So this is the original video vector gate lab from Orlau. Um, and it was an analog lab, absolutely brilliant, absolutely marvelous. And of course, now we're using digital video vector gate labs um, uh, at, in London, I've been working at latterly. And then from doing that and working with patients and really understanding it, taking a slightly different view of how to understand walking, being very focused on segment, segment alignment, segment proportions, segment kinematics, um, really honing in on definitions and terminology, because much as I love engineers, often their language can confuse clinical working. So making sure everything's defined. Of course, from the clinical work could get big data sets like this. This is the biggest published study of SVA alignments in children, 112 legs, could get data sets to inform other people. Write some algorithms, because everybody kept saying, how are you doing, what are you doing? Uh, how do you do it? How do you do it? How do you do it? So just wrote what we did down in algorithms, yeah? And they're very instinctual when you get to use them, as George said yesterday, they're really instinctual. It is what you do in clinic. It's what you do in your head in five minutes in your head. Um, and then turning that into uh, research. Um, this was just a lady who came on a training day. So I run a training course all over the world and she came on the training day and we could publish from that, yeah? Um, by doing some clinical work and then getting it published um, in PO International. All the algorithms are published um, now. So basically, my advice to people is do all these things, uh, get some clinical work, et cetera, et cetera. Think outside the box, train others, because from training others, you learn to, from them, and you can train others, develop algorithms. Everybody needs algorithms. Simplify the learning, not only for the patient, but for the people who are are uh, learning from you. So I spend a lot of time trying to simplify what are complex uh, problems in my teaching and um, training. And so there we go, there's some references anyway. But every, and of course, developed Oscar, um, which is about segment alignment, segment kinematics, segment proportion, basis support, central mass, force of moments, muscle length, et cetera, neurobiomechanics and motor learning. Thanks for that, Lane. Cheers for that. Um, would you like to stop sharing your screen just so everyone comes back? Oh, sorry, back. yeah. Yeah, it's just so everyone can see each other. Um, thanks for that, everyone. Um, I'd just like to begin with sort of uh, a quite sort of open-ended question for that anyone can jump in with. I think after our, I'm not sure if anyone saw our talk this morning, but we had um, a speaker, Mark Inglis, who um, he really sort of brought it back to why we were all in p and and sort of an inspiration of why um, we're all sort of looking at a career in this um, field and just wanted to get what still inspires you on a day-to-day -day basis and what keeps you within the field, really. Um, anybody like to step in? I'll go if you want. <laughs> um, I think for me, it's training others, training young, you know, older people and young. So I've been sort of teaching for about 20 years, because as soon as we got the gate lab, everyone, well, I was teaching before that, but people kept saying, um, what you're doing, what you're doing, can you come and tell us what you're doing? Um, so for me, it's often about um, training others so they can take things on and um, develop them well. Um, and also the patients, basically, working with patients. So of course, when you start working with children, with disability, really, you're in there for the long haul. You're, you're thinking about how they're going to be when they're 16, 20, 25, 35, 45, 50, 60, 70. So it's really important to have a very long view with the family and to explain to the family about prognosis and the options that they, they have available to them. Um, so for me, there's two things that keep me in. One, I love working with the children and the families. I think they're absolutely, you learn a lot every time you meet a new family. Um, and I love being in with the long haul. It's hard. It's really hard being in with the long haul, but um, being in the long haul with them right through their lives till they're grown up and beyond. And um, also um, training other people who can take things forward and improve the knowledge um, further. OK, thanks, Alain. Um, anybody else like to add anything to that? Peter? Yeah, I think, yeah um, uh, well, I certainly enjoy uh, being in a multidisciplinary environment. And, and, you know, there's a saying that it, it, it's, it's, it's nice to be in a place where you're not the smartest person. So you then have the opportunity to learn from others. 
So I quite often find myself in a room uh, with my students and, you know, very often I'm not the smartest person, you know, especially in the area that they are working on. So uh, that usually stimulate you know, a very good discussion and, and I, I usually enjoy that, that type of interaction. So I, if you, I guess coming back to your question, what, you know, get me excited going to work is, is probably something like this, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I think it's Paul Fellingham here. I hope you can hear me okay. Sorry, there's some background noise here. Um, so, you know, what gets excited for us, um, you know, we, we often forget in our business that every device we make changes lives. It saves lives. Um, so the medical devices we make, you know, for example, uh, models to remove large tumors from, from children, especially in the pediatric world. So really, you know, to, uh, as Peter mentioned, you know, I work with a bunch of people who are far smarter than I am. Uh, and it's really great to see what you make and the people you work with and how it affects their lives and how it changes their lives in a very positive manner. Kathy, would you like to add anything or should we? Yeah, for me, it's uh, something about people and, and changing power dynamics. So I, I love um, I love working and teaching and, and, and educating. And, and like everyone said, I don't I'm certainly not the smartest. I don't, I don't think it's even about being smartest. I, I think it's more about kind of combining experiences and, and then trying to do something together. So I, I frequently don't know what I'm doing when I start a project. <laughs> um, I've got some idea. I, don't, I definitely don't know how it's going to work. Um, and I think figuring that out the team is is great. Um, and then in terms of the power thing, I, I think from a very early age, I've been quite fascinated by systematic power, um, you know, within countries or within like what, why some people have access to some things and some people don't. Um, and so for me, although I love, you know, creating technology, I, I love being in the lab, you know, working with materials and, and creating new technologies. I also love working at that systems infrastructure place and having very difficult conversations with governments where they're making very difficult decisions about budgets and trying to sometimes just nudge them 1% in the, in the right direction, you know, and, and you come away from that conversation and other people might think you've lost that conversation, like that was a ridiculous outcome, but, but actually you know that it could have gone 20% the other way and you you've probably made the big, a bigger impact. Even sometimes nobody ever knows about those conversations. You know, you're, you're trying to have them to, to make to make things better. So I, I, yeah, I love going into the lab and working with people. And then I love going into to battle, if you like, with these large systems to see how we how we change them for the better. Um, it's quite interesting here that you've all sort of brought up the user as uh, quite a key focus for this. Do you think, in general, that is a big enough focus in the p &O industry and what's being done that the user is based at the sort of centre of projects or from the clinical point of view for your sort of respective fields. Do you think that's an issue that needs addressing? I'll go first because I'm, I'm not a P&O expert and, and so I give an outside view. Yeah. I have never met anybody who works in the P&O field that doesn't really care about users. I, I, like every time you go to an ISPO event or any time you meet a, a physio, an OT, a researcher in this area, everybody's absolutely dedicated to the user. I would think about you know some of the stuff that Paul was saying about setting up a company and, and like trying to do it as a, a social enterprise and then having to change I think sometimes maybe our, well, from the outside perspective, sometimes the focus can almost be too narrow on the, on the individual with an amputation or, or, or who needs the, the device, um, because actually the wider system allows for the infrastructure for, for that to happen. And sometimes I think we, we also need to consider who's paying for all of the infrastructure costs. How do we make sure there's enough trained personnel? How do we make sure there's enough you know, policies that will give out prosthetic devices in, in certain countries? So. Um, yeah, I'm working with a few startups now to try and help broaden that slightly away from just that user product fit to, to keeping that focus, but maybe broadening the users to also being the purchasers and the procurers and the distributors and, and the trainers. So... Anybody else got anything to add? Yeah, I, I, so I've worked with uh, in p and uh, orthopedics, um, uh, maxillofacial, Area. So, in fact, if I look at you know the broad uh, musculoskeletal area, the PNO industry, um, uh, the users are probably one of the most active uh, community, um, and I think the interactions or um, information that that we can get out of the users are are, are much more interactive uh, compared to 
you know, a total hip replacement or total joint replacement patient. So I think, I think um, um, this, this industry has benefited a lot from the user. And, and I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's one of those that you can really see the, 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 a very strong interaction. Yeah, um, that's, that's how I felt you know, working, working in this area. Mm -hmm. Anybody else like anything to add? Or... Um, okay, then we've uh, we had another question. Um, I know a lot of you have all sort of had very diverse careers and sort of changed career paths quite a lot. I'm just asking how hard this was for you to change career paths and is there sort of the opportunities to do this? How do you, how do you find them? Where do you begin? Tough question. <laughs> Lots of silence here. Uh, I'll, I'll give it a little, little shot to start with Paul, Paul Fotheringham here. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it is difficult, you know, is it a conscious decision you want to make a, a very gear change in your career? So for mine, it wasn't exactly a gear change. Technology has been the focus of my, my career for 20 odd years. Um, but really, I think it's about where do you want to see yourself in sort of five, 10 years, you know, working in an office or, or, or doing some good really. And that's really what we wanted to do to take our technology skills and translate that into, into some useful part of the world to be honest, uh, as opposed to working in the banking industry. Um, and so really, you know, um, you know, you make your own opportunities. Uh, unfortunately, things don't just fall in your lap. So you have to go and seek out for them. You know, we, we always say there's no luck in a small business. Um, you have to go out there uh, and, and strive and be very uh, tenacious towards um, finding these opportunities for you. Anybody else? I haven't really <laughs> changed careers, but I think what I did was train myself up so that, because um, in many ways in Bangor, I did, we, as we know, in the UK, we're very short of orthotists. Um, so in Bangor, um, a lot of the, the skills that we did to go to the transdisciplinary where I could do quite a lot of them uh, because of the, the extra training and that. And I think now we've got training programs going on in the UK, haven't we? Where, where there's going to, I think there just needs to be much more joint training in a way and trans trans disciplinary work there's never going to be enough professionals to do this work so why would a child have their leg length measured by three different professionals when one professional can measure the leg length like we had joint clinic with our orthopedic consultant and they 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 if we'd measure the leg length they'd accept our leg length if they really needed to measure it to be sure again they'd do it again but they'd accept if we'd measured a one centimeter leg length discrepancy that they could trust us it was a one centimeter leg length discrepancy and that rather than putting the child through yet another um sort of person measuring the leg length again um uh, so i think it i think there's um big scope for perhaps people um I mean, they can change professions, but actually really scope for people um, expanding their professions and, and having additional qualifications within their professions that allows people to work transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary much more. Yeah, when, when, I, when I think about career-wise, uh, although I've changed a, a couple of times, but um, the, the interest that, that uh, the area that I want to work in somewhat remains the same. Um, so I've applied it in the defense industry. I applied in you know, the rehabilitation industry, musculoskeletal, and you now in, in academia. But but I guess the the interest is, is what sustain you. So your job may change, uh, but you sort of keep doing you know the the, the things that you are interested in. In, in for my case, it's, it's been biomechanics. Uh, right through all, all my career, even when I was you know, dealing with uh, business as a business development manager, I was looking at you know, the med tech side of things. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, um, so the, the other advice I would say is, is not to be afraid of um, changing. So you may, you may say after your PhD, you're interested in an academic career, and then you know, an opportunity comes up that, that is nothing to do with, with academia, and you, you, you find that it's exciting, interesting. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, should, I should think that you can consider it seriously. Because when I look back, uh, all those training that I have outside academia is actually helping me now. 
because as an academic, sometimes I'm I'm acting like a business manager. Sometimes, you know, I'm acting like a supervisor. So all those skills that I've collated you know, over the years um, did, did make me a better academic. Yeah, that's that's something I sort of uh, want to pick up on a bit. You've talked a lot about the sort of multidisciplinary um, teams and how the transferable skills that you can use um, really sort of helped your career. I think for sort of Peter, Paul, Kathy, you've, you've gone and taken, started in one area and then ended up uh, taking products to commercialisation or starting your own businesses. How sort of hard was that? And like, where did you find the support to do that? How did you sort of develop the skills really? It seems like a really big so change in attitude, change in a skill set almost from what you were doing previous. Um, I'll jump in there then. I- Thinking about my career, like when you look back on things, you try and think like, what is the thread that pulls it all together? I think it's how interactions between people, but that's what I care. Like, I love just making, understanding teams. I love psychology. I love that. How do we make things, things happen? And that's my love of innovation as well. Like, how do we, because innovation has to be adopted and there's a lot of behavior change, a lot of change within that. And so um, I think that in order to to try something new, I um, I personally think you, you, the, you can do some good work on just understanding yourself, really understanding yourself, understanding what really motivates you, what you and what your values are. Because once you know those things, actually some of my career will look very similar. Like I might have very similar roles of education and like I really care about, I really, really cared about transport engineers, understanding how difficult it was for wheelchair users and people with mobility impairments to get around the built environment. I really cared about that. And I really cared about translating biomechanics into, into the way that a, a transport engineer would be able to make a difference so that the next generation of tube was, was better. But I really did care about that. Equally, I really cared about wheelchair users getting better skills, you know, but they were all just, in, just interactions. And my value was about empowering the individual within a system that you know, was most efficient to support them. And, and I think that value is actually the same no matter where I am. If I'm talking to the government in Kenya, if I'm talking to, to, to Paul about a new project, if I'm, I'm talking to you know, Lawrence about a new project, whatever it might be, it's, it's, it's that value about how do I work with people that uh, are equally motivated to make the world a bit of a better place, uh, whilst also ensuring that disabled people and, and generally marginalised or vulnerable groups are advanced in life and, and so I think once you know your values it's quite easy to pick and choose projects and, and pick and choose a path and, and it's okay like Peter says I mean my time in Medtronic I didn't love Medtronic it's a great place to work but I didn't love it but I learned a lot I, I learned a lot about how to manage a project how to execute a project what how a big multinational works and, and then that's helped me a lot when we started the Global Disability Innovation Hub. Like when I started talking to these companies, I, I know their infrastructure, right? And I also know how to be a bit more professional than maybe an academic would be <laughs> um, in terms of those conversations and how to get a contract over the line and how to get things into contract and how to make sure it's delivered within contract, which sometimes, again, doesn't work within academia. So I think there's lots of things you pick up along the way. I don't think any experience is wasted, provided you know yourself and you know your reaction to that like okay this isn't for me and I know why it's not for me and therefore I know what I want next and and, and so I, I think a little bit of introspection is a is a good thing. Paul do you have anything to add there? Sorry I was talking to mute there um no I mean I guess from my perspective you know it's a bit more of a, a cold hard business view of things about you know uh you know, when I started this business, I'm not medically trained, but it's not a barrier to honest. So we've learned an awful lot and pulled in the people who have that knowledge. And really, you know, your question was around, you know, taking product to the market. How difficult is it? Very difficult, I would say, um, to understand how you fund that, to understand the right people you need to bring in, uh, to understand the regulatory pathway, to understand all of the compliance and all of the uh, of the medical device directives you have to do um, and money. You, know, you have to understand about how you can you fund your business to take these products to market. Um, you know, that might be through uh, seed funding, that might be through you know, larger uh, in, investment capitals, funding, et cetera. But really to work out, does the business model from my perspective, yes, we want to help everyone, but if I don't have a business to help someone, then it's not going to happen. So you have to understand about how you can still have finances to keep the business going to do the great work. Um, so, is it, yeah, so um, we've had a question in from uh, 
upon in the audience saying there's a lot of solutions but often little appetite to find and implement um, these solutions do you think the researchers engineers clinicians can best help uh, how do you think researchers engineers clinicians can best help to contribute to assistive technology provision becoming a higher societal priority Mm. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, 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 so I'm, I'm not exactly very clear about the question, um, but I suppose maybe what I can, yeah, Sean, you want to? I think he's sort of saying basically there's, there's, there is potentially the technology and the solutions out there, but um, the, uh, the sort of the appetite where either the demand from, say, maybe the market and funders, like you're saying, isn't there to get these solutions. Right. So we need to how do we make assistive technology a greater sort of priority um, in terms of sort of funding and things like that? Yeah, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, I, I think I think funding is 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 obviously um, an issue um, to to move things further. But I I I sometimes feel that it shouldn't be a roadblock um, because, a, like for example, we 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 have we have put up. You know, competitive fundings uh, to 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 the government uh, to do an X, Y, and Z project, uh, and then because those project could be could be in the basket of yeah, they are not 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 that popular, doesn't target a big population, may not solve the whole world's problem, and 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 they get pushed down, and you you don't get funded, right? But but instead, uh, what happened? That project got funded by uh, philanthropy, right? Individuals who have a passion, you know, for 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 this course. So I think I think we we, we shouldn't always we, we should be a little bit more open um, rather than assistive technology has always been a, a challenge to get get funding. Uh, I recognize that, uh, and but but so far we still got quite a lot of work done. Uh, through different means. Uh, they could be individual companies who are interested in a specific product uh, that they want to take to the market, or they could be individuals, you know, um, through philanthropy. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I would say if, if we always see funding as the roadblock, um, we will never get anything started. Yeah. Has um, anyone else got anything to add there? If not, then um, I'd quite like, I think we've got some sort of clinicians in the um, the audience as well. And I'd quite like to sort of bring it around to that side of the thing. And um, Elaine, really, you've really managed to sort of balance um, and sort of achieve a, like a, a career in a, being a clinician, but also a highly international recognised researcher. Is that common in the clinical world? Did you have to really drive them opportunities <laughs> yourself? As I understand it, no. People say, no, I, you know, I... Um, so basically, nearly everything I've done that um, involved being able to write things up, do data sets, do a lot of training, you know, I had some support from the National Health Service, but by and large, a lot of that had to be done in your own time, at your own expense, basically, that, that's how it was, really. Um, um, so, um, no, I don't, I don't think it is that common. I think it's very sad, really. The problem in the NHS is you're employed to treat patients. You know, you're not employed to do research. Um, you can try and apply for grant money and it's very difficult to get, particularly in, in disability. It's really hard to get anything. We applied a few times for proper research money, um, refused every time sort of thing. Um, but basically, no, it was all, I mean, it wasn't only me. Um, all my staff were people who would put a huge amount of time in. So all the staff in Bangor would stay late. We'd all stay late working with the patients and, and then doing things like collecting data sets and just writing the algorithms so that people understand what we're doing. Um, so I think it's quite unusual. I think it's a shame um, because I think there has been more divergence between the clinicians and the researcher. Um, and I think that, you know, that, that, I think that does create some problems really. But um, it is as it is, you know, that's how it is, really. Yeah, do you see it changing at all, really, in the sort of... Mm. I think the other thing I'd just add into the discussion is that um, getting in charge of managing something and giving oneself, uh, getting a, some control in a department. 
So I was the manager department and also at times was manager of the orthotic budget and all stuff like that, you know, and the orthopedic clinics. I think if you can get some control of things, you can often make things work um, better. That's harder in the National Health Service these days than it was in the old, in the old days. It was much easier to, to pull people together, create teams, have joint clinics and stuff like that. Um, but I think that's something that, you know, actually, you know, being joint departments, sharing budgets and stuff like that is very important for making things move forward because people can spend an awful lot of time just arguing between departments otherwise. And you just need to break through all that and get on with the job, don't you? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, it's also just uh, fine, I think, quickly. I, Kathy, I picked up on something you were saying in uh, sort of uh, in your presentation about um, how you mouse sort of struggled initially in the sort of male-dominated engineering world. Um, is has that changed a lot since um, those experiences for you? And like, do you see opportunities, sort of more equal opportunities available now? And is it easier for women to sort of get involved in engineering? It's not as daunting, or is it? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely different. Um, I initially did civil engineering, actually. I did undenominate, and I did a couple of weeks of civil engineering, and I left because I was like, God, in, in, in Galway, I was like, I can't handle this. Uh, there was too many sexist jokes within the first two weeks that I was like, I've just, you know, I don't want to do this. And so I, I moved to industrial uh, design. But I have to say, since I've moved to UCL, I've never noted any sort of um, gender or, or any other type of um, bias. Um, I think it is easier, though. It, it, there is something about... It, you know, it's the same with anybody, right? If, if you're all a group of, of people from, from England, you'll have a certain sort of group, you know, my, group think, right? You've got a certain type of mentality. So it doesn't matter if it's all women or all men or all transgender people or, you know, like you want diversity in teams because that, that brings out the best. And I think in UCL now, we, you know, we nearly have 50-50 in undergraduates and education uh, and all of the outreach programmes, we do a, a 50-50 plus obviously um, transgender, but but that's, that doesn't really note in percentages just yet. Um, but yeah, I think it is easier. I, I think that even, you know, I was talking to somebody just last night, one of my PhD students actually, it was lunch, we went for lunch yesterday, uh, and we were just talking about how even when things can look diverse, they're not diverse, if that makes sense. So you can have people that might all look or come from different um, ethnic backgrounds, for example, but they all went to a private school in England, they went to Oxford, <laughs> and they've had a very similar life. Does that make sense? Like, so I think it's not necessarily just about the characteristics we can measure, but also about getting under the skin of, of different people's experiences and, and, and getting to know each other so that, so that we know that. But I, I think it is changing. I think it's different uh, when you go overseas. I, I know when I wasn't a professor and I was having conversations, for example, in India and Kenya, being a woman was problematic. Um, you know, that, that now that I'm a professor, sometimes that changes, which I find quite bizarre anyway, because I'm the same person as I was. <laughs> you know, I exactly, might be saying exactly the same thing, but they, but they like the title. So some cultures as well prefer the title uh, or might prefer the uh, thing. And, and I think that, that brings its own sense of uh, responsibility with it. You have to be more careful about what you say because people might take it without considering it, you know, as, as just an individual's opinion. So. Um, but I do think it's changing, and that's good. More diversity is good. I'd like to see even more diversity, not just on gender, but across the board of protected characteristics and also across the board of um, socioeconomic things, you know, like people from, from harsher backgrounds getting to the top would be good. Um, well, I think I've sort of lost track of time slightly, so um, I think we should wrap that up. I just wanted to quickly ask just one last thing. Is there a sort of a particular action or thing that anyone could that you could do at this time you advise in your career to sort of help you in the future one thing you could uh, make a sort of change today that would help you in the future got any sort of pearls of wisdom before we leave hey again yeah, John. Would... oh sorry Elaine, go ahead uh, i was just saying if there's any sort of action you could take today that um that could give you sort of meaningful change in the future that um, sort of practical day-to-day -day changes that uh, could really help you out? Well, I, I just have a, uh, I, I think team teamwork uh, is, is, is something that uh, I've underestimated over the years. And I'm beginning to learn a, a lot more um, as, as we grow. Um, people matters, yeah, most. It, it's, it's, it's all about people, right? 
Yeah, and I think I think having having a good team, uh, just just help you imagine a future that that you you could never imagine. Yeah. I wasn't sure who you wanted to help out. Like, did, was it about helping ourselves out or helping the patients out? Um, no, it's just all ourselves in the career. Yeah, ourselves, like me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. What would help me? Oh, don't know. <laughs> Less work, I think. Um, but, <laughs> I'll second that. I agree, I agree with teamwork. Teamwork's the key um, to absolutely everything. But one thing I really like is people just to use a video to do key analysis. That would be the one thing that would really help professions and the patient a lot. Because whenever I ask people, like, you know, a lot of the work I do, you can do by eye, you don't need a gate lab. But one thing really helps you is just having a little video clip and playing it frame by frame. And when you ask people, like I'm just teaching a course, we've got 250 people all over the world. When you ask how many people have a gate lab, hardly anyone. How many people have a video camera yet? Yeah. Do you use it? No. So some of that is around um, data protection, data storage, managers being worried about that. So if we could get over that issue of managers allowing people to use simple bits of video clips to go frame by frame by frame to analyzing movement, walking, whatever they're doing, that would help people very substantially. And the other thing would be people really understanding what normal gait is, because there's lots of misunderstandings about how people walk when we're talking about walking. Thank you. Um, Kathy, Paul, do you have anything to add? Honestly, what would help me? Diary management support <laughs> would be the, the most critical thing. Uh, I think um, sometimes as an academic, we get pulled in a lot. Of, you know, I'm a director of the company as well, of, of the GDI hub, and um, I get pulled in a lot of directions. Um, and so sometimes it's just making sure I take enough time to, to look down to see what's really important but you know, am i spending my time in the most important area um so yeah i, I have a continual fight with ucl over having diary management support so i'm not allowed to bring it in myself because it's within the ucl system otherwise i just pay for it myself um but i'm not allowed uh, and they won't give it to me uh, so that's that's the biggest thing so i think if from your guys point of view i think as you're growing as a, as a person I think really learning to manage your time and making sure you're putting it in the right place is, is very important. But also when you're trying to get buy in or ask people who are very busy to do things, uh, making sure that you communicate in a way that's easy for them to accept <laughs> uh, is, is, is a good thing, too. Can I add one more in quickly? Ever so quick. It's because it's very relevant to all this. It's about engineers understanding when engineering language can confuse clinicians when messages are passed on verbally. So to an engineer, often plantar flexion may be something very different to uh, a physiotherapist or an orthopedist. So being really clear where things like neutral angle and all these things, how when they're, when they're published in papers, how they can confuse clinicians and how we really have to have some really common language with definitions that are not con confusing clinicians and confusing clinical practice. That would really, really help. We can't hear you, Sean. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for all for coming. I think it's all got time for. It's really, um, really good opportunity to get your insight into that. And um, we'll be back shortly with the um, global perspective session um, in around five minutes. Thank you, everyone, for coming along. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Sean. Thanks, everyone. Nice to meet you all. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.